Welcome back to Tales From Our Pocket. We are in Brussels today and I am so excited to be here. Some fantastic foods come from Brussels. I love chocolate, I'm excited to eat all the chocolate, but Belgium is known for more than just chocolate. They're also known for their fries, their mussels, their waffles, and their beer. Our mussels are here. All right, let's try them. And we're gonna try all of it today here in Brussels while we take in the sights. Behind me, actually it's sort of off to my right, off to my side is the beautiful town hall with its tower that's over 300 feet high that you can see from multiple vantage points from all over central Brussels. This is kind of a happening place right now. The weather today has been rainy, it's been sunny, and it's neat to see all the people that have come out now that the rain has taken a break. This is really fun. Most of the buildings you see behind me were reconstructed in the 1600s after being destroyed. The number five building behind me is actually an original from medieval times. Let's go get started. Our first stop is a waffle shop. This is our chosen stop for waffles. We are hoping to try two kinds. Belgian waffles, wait, do you call them that? Here? Aren't they all Belgian waffles? <laughs> okay, the place that we're going to is a chain that has multiple locations. The first one had no waffles. This one has waffles, so take two. Okay, so the store worker helped me order and we got two waffles. One is a Brussels waffle and the other one is a Liege waffle. We're gonna try the Liege waffle first. This one he recommended having plain. Oh, it's really sweet. It has like honey around the outside and it's really crispy and the inside is nice and warm. This is like the perfect street food. Just eat it while walking around or sitting. Oh, so good. All right, so the second one is the Brussels waffle. This one he recommended with chocolate and strawberry and he gave us so much whipped cream. <laughs> I managed to get everything onto one forkful, so let's see how this one compares. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to fit this off. Well, that's delicious. I don't know which one wins the waffle contest. They're both really good. We're just gonna have to keep eating while we're here in Belgium in order to discover which one we like best. They're delicious. Okay, we need a break from all of the sweet things we've already eaten, and this is the perfect place to do it. This is a church that's just off of the main square in Brussels, and it's St. Nicholas Church. Although the exterior of it is modern, it dates back in the interior to the late 1300s, but it's been remodeled so many times over hundreds of years that apparently there's this mishmash of styles inside, so I'm really curious to see what this looks like and how it turned out. To be honest, I did not see a mishmash of styles. All I saw was a beautiful church that's been well restored over the years. <laughs> For our first chocolate stop today, because you know, we're gonna have multiples, we've decided to stop at Godiva Chocolates. Yes, it's a brand that we have back in the United States, but this is the very first Godiva shop anywhere. So we have to try it. How is it different from the stuff in the US? Let's go find out. We have our Godiva chocolates in hand. Now we'll see how they compare. What is yours? Mine is hazelnut and it's delicious. Mine is framboise, which we think is strawberry. It's so rich. Oh my gosh. Mine's a mix of truffle and white chocolate. And this is the church where all of the royal families got married and their funerals take place and it's free to go into, so let's go check it out.
the next stop we're headed to looks like possibly one of the prettiest malls that I've ever seen. So I'm really curious to stick our heads inside and see what it looks like. It reminds me a lot of the covered shopping galleries that are in Paris. Plus, I don't see any chains here. No major chain brands, at least not that I recognize. So I tell you back, there are brands that I recognize here and they're the chocolate shops. I don't recognize anything but the chocolate shops. But the chocolate shops, I recognize. There's a cafe that I read, it has an Art Nouveau interior and I'm still stalling before our next food stop. So we're gonna just stick our heads inside and see what it looks like. If I was hungry, I would eat here. This is beautiful. Stained glass, look. All right, we stalled long enough. It's time for our next food stop. We are switching now from sweet to savory. We maybe have done this in the opposite direction that we should have. <laughs> there is a place that every time we've gone by it, it has a line out the door for fries. So that is the place that we are choosing to have our Belgian fries, uh, like in a half hour when we're done standing in the line. <laughs> longer than a few minutes later. <laughs> Messy. So we are here at Freeland. The fries, we are told, are double fried in beef fat. Perfectly healthy. I'm sure this is the healthiest thing we're going to have today. So we've got a couple different kinds of sauces. We've got curry ketchup, which I'll try first. Lots of flavor there, nice and soft in the middle, crispy on the outside. It's excellent. We also got something they call pita sauce. It's a little like a tzatziki, but they said it's mostly garlic. Heather's gonna love the tzatziki. Garlic, garlic, garlic. Well, we are getting so full already. Our next stop though, we think is gonna be a pretty crowded one. It's a pretty famous site here in Brussels, a little bit strange. Here's a hint of what we're seeing next. It's smaller than you expected, isn't it? <laughs> it's ridiculous. It is actually smaller than I expected. I expected it to be small and it was still smaller. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which is more ridiculous, the size of the statue or the size of the crowd surrounding the statue. I mean, this is Mona Lisa level stuff here. Although the Mona Lisa comparison is a pretty good one, <laughs> uh, I believe when you go to see the Mona Lisa, it's actually the real Mona Lisa. And that statue is a replica. The real one is in a museum. It has been vandalized and stolen so often that they needed to protect it. So all we get is the replica and it's starting to rain again. Or I got pooped on. Probably got pooped on. Yeah, great. While we were looking at the statue, a group came up to us and for some school project needed to play rock, paper, scissors. Turns out I have a secret superpower. No way! <laughs> uh, again? So that was kind of amazing. I don't think you can throw the game of rock, paper, scissors, can you? We're just walking to our next place and we just found the coolest street with the coolest old buildings on it. And all we're doing is following directions to our next place. This is an amazing street and it's pedestrian only too. So cool. Look. We couldn't leave with just having a good day of chocolate. We are at our second chocolate stop of the day. This is Laurent Jabot, which is the 2021 Chocolatier of the Year. So let's see how they compare to a brand that we can get back home. Let's pop inside. We 
have traveled a little bit outside of the historic center in search of some hopefully non-touristy mussels here in Brussels. That's just kind of fun to say. You want to say it over and over, mussels in Brussels. I have waited a long time to have mussels here and I am super excited to try them. Belgium is known for its fruity beers and it was also recommended to give one of them a try with the mussels. So we've got here a cherry beer, which is very characteristic. It's a creek. I don't remember exactly the word in French, but it translates to sudden death. <clears throat> well, it's really tasty. It's very sweet and it's very cherry. And I'm feeling all right. I don't think I'm gonna die anytime soon. In fact, I might have some more. Our mussels are here. All right, let's try them. They smell super garlicky. We ordered them with wine and garlic and cream. Mmm, <laughs> they're really good. Really briny, nice texture, not rubbery. They're delicious. I feel like it's gonna take us forever to eat this pot though, and then will we be full when it's done? I don't know. <laughs> they're so good. Do you eat them with your fingers? I'm probably doing this all wrong. I'm, I'm sorry, Belgium. This is really good. All the mussels are really good. The sauce is excellent. And we got a little bit of bread here. We're able to mop up some of the sauce, which is really nice. We've also got the plum frites or frites, frites or fries, which just go perfectly with the mussels and the beer. We ordered just one portion, which was plenty for us to split. We've actually heard that that's, that's typical and the restaurants are happy to let you share. Highly recommend this if you come to this area. Mussels, cherry beer, and fries. It all just went really well together. Delicious. Definitely recommend the Bistro Porta Hall if you are in Brussels and want to try some mussels. I just can't stop rhyming. And it's right <laughs> across the street from a great view of this really cool old castle. Now we are going to try the chocolates from the 2021 Chocolatier of the Year. More rhyming. I, I can't, I just... Now we lost track of which one was which, so we're actually just going to each try a half and then treat. So That's the best way to do it anyhow. You get to try multiples. Okay. Mine has a speculose interior. It's more sugary than speculose. That is really different. It's a ganache filling. So the one I had was cacahuete, which is peanut. It was actually peanut butter. It actually tastes freshly made. Heather loves peanut butter. We'll see how this goes. It's like a ganache Reese's peanut butter cup, except better. <laughs> that was really different. It was really good. We have one more stop to make and we have saved the best for last. And then I'm gonna roll myself back to our place. <laughs> We mentioned that we saved the best for last. Here we are. This is the Royal Palace of Belgium here in Brussels. And it is normally closed to visitors, but it opens about five weeks a year. And we happen to be here when they're open and managed to snag entry tickets. So we are going to see the inside of the Royal Palace. This one is actually inhabited by the King and Queen of Belgium who live here in Brussels. And that's really unique that we're able to go in and see where they're currently living. I'm not sure that there's another palace in Europe where you're able to do that. I'm so excited to see what the inside of this looks like. If you decide to tour the Royal Palace while you're here, here are just a couple things you need to know. First, you make a reservation online. It's super easy, but they do fill up, so book early. Two, they don't allow large backpacks or liquids right now, so leave them back at the place that you're staying at or in a locker nearby. super interesting. The palace is incredibly opulent. I can't imagine having this be your everyday home and be surrounded by 
the magnificent artwork and these rooms that are just massive in size. They're huge. It's a good gig if you can get it. <laughs> There's a lot of information in the palace about what the royal family has been doing over the years, especially in the 20th century, and a lot of very recent information about what they've been doing during the pandemic and helping the community and, and Belgian society in general. I will say I did not expect it to be a solid marketing campaign for the royalty of Belgium. Everything was incredibly well signed in at least four languages. Yeah. Uh, so it was really interesting to go through. I would recommend it if you happen to be here during uh, the couple of weeks that it's open. And besides, the price is right. It's completely free. <laughs> we have a lot more to come from the rest of Belgium and Southern Netherlands. We hope you enjoyed our DIY food tour today. If you enjoy watching Americans try food from other cultures, we're gonna do that all over the world, so be sure to subscribe. Welcome back to another day in Brussels. In our last video, we shared with you some of the main sites. In this video, we're gonna go off the beaten path a little bit and show you some things that we've heard about that are a little bit more quirky. The body decomposes, it lets off gases until just a quirkier side of Brussels. Our starting point for today is not necessarily a secret, but it's a beautiful view over Brussels at Montar. This is a great place to start our journey. While you're at the park before you leave, don't forget to take a look at the bells that are behind me with the clock. Each of the hours on the clock has its own separate figurine that would come out when the music played. Now the clock isn't right, so even though they're working on restoring it, I'm not hopeful that we're gonna hear the bells ring because it's not five to eight a.m. or eight p.m. It's not even close to the time that it actually is. This is also a good time to note that we have a little reveal we're gonna do at the end of this video, so make sure you stay tuned all the way to the end so you don't miss it. the train station is this awesome smurf mural on the ceiling. And it'll make you do this and this. You kind of have to do some acrobatics to see it, but wow, it's so, so cool. Beer. Oh, this is like all the best of Belgium. Look, here's waffles, fries, chocolates. It's so hard to fit everything into one shop, but this is so cool. I must come back and stay here. It really makes me look forward to stopping at the Comic Art Museum later. This is one of the coolest things that we've seen in Brussels, that all of the Smurfs are so much fun to look at. I could sit here looking at them for a really long time, but we don't have time. It's time to go on to the next thing. Let's go. Just a short walk down the road is one of the oldest shopping galleries in all of Europe. It dates back to 1847 and is named, it's Gallery Bortier, and it's not in as good of shape as the one that we went into yesterday, but I'm expecting something a little bit more atmospheric. seeking out some unusual things today here in Brussels, we still have to try some chocolate. The shop that you see behind me is one that you're not gonna find in the guidebooks. Although they do have locations worldwide, there aren't any in the US, and it's not one of the major, major, major brands. This chocolate store is known for working directly with farmers in the country where the cocoa beans are grown, and they have access to some very, very rare cocoa beans. They are very well regarded by locals here in Brussels, and I am super excited to try out their chocolate. I forgot to mention, it's the building with all the hats on it, which is also kind of quirky. Thank you, Joy. As soon as we went in, we were given a little taste of what they do with the cocoa shells afterwards, and it turns into this amazing, amazing drink. Of it tastes like chocolate, but it's not. Oh, it was incredible. Uh, they do not sell, like you can't go in and buy a single chocolate, so uh, unfortunately we had to buy a box. So let's see if they are worth the hype. There's only one of each flavor, so we have to share each of them. So here goes a half a piece of chocolate. Oh my god. You think you took more than half? <laughs> That's delicious. It's very, very smooth dark chocolate. Not overly sweet, not overly bitter. They managed to strike the exact right balance for dark chocolate. That's delicious. I kind of wish we bought a bigger box. 
even though this place is known for, well, its colorful hats and chocolates, their macaroons came highly recommended as well. This is pistachio. Only eat half, only eat half. I only ate a third. <laughs> This might be the best macaroon I've had. The center is really soft and really creamy. And I can tell from Heather's expression on her face that if I don't give this to her quick, we're going to have a situation. <laughs> that is really good. Might be the best I've ever had. today's quirky Brussels tour, we knew that we wanted to go to a museum that was not quite fine arts. And so we've chosen for our museum today a comic art museum. I'm super interested to learn more about Belgium's connection to comics, and I'm also hoping there's something about the Smurfs here. Tintin is really famous and many others, so let's go check it out. That's a fitting end for the comic museum. That was really neat. I'm glad they had Smurfs. We got to find out a lot more history about them. Funny thing, the first time that we came to the Netherlands, <laughs> we had no idea that the Smurfs were created by a Belgian and that they were so important to the sort of Benelux region. And there was this parade taking place and Smurfs went by and we were like, why are there Smurfs in the parade? <laughs> So it's kind of neat to have that come full circle and see them here in the Comic Art Museum. They had a lot of different displays about current relevant Belgian illustrators and non-Belgian illustrators. They covered sort of the history of comics. Uh, it was really interesting. It was really interesting. And if you have time, there is a library that you can actually go into and just read comics to your heart's content. Sadly, Bill pulled me out of there because we have other things we need to do. So let's go to our next stop. I was taking a walk through this neighborhood the other day and I found this thing they called a close. It sounds like a little courtyard and if you ask permission from the right person across the street, they'll give you a key. So we got the key. We're going to go check it out. <laughs> this is the courtyard of the close. I'm talking kind of quietly because we are the only people in here thanks to our key that we got across the road. The only people here and there's benches and I can hear silverware so some people are getting ready for dinner. This is a really nice escape. The guy at the information desk called it a fake river, but there's actually water in it. So I don't know if it rained recently or maybe if it just doesn't go anywhere, but there's definitely water down there. If you're looking for a quick break from the crowds, this is a really easy and free courtyard to drop into. So if you're in the area, we would recommend it. It's maybe not something I'd travel across town for, but definitely if you're nearby, stick your head in. If you've been following us for any length of time, you might have noticed that I love to stop and pet the dogs. <laughs> Lazy day here at the winery. <laughs> and in our last video, you might have noticed a very famous, tinier than expected statue. There is not only the peeing boy in Brussels, but there's also a peeing dog. So I gotta go pet it, I guess. I 
I am happy to report the dog is life size, unlike the child. <laughs> Another perk to visiting the peeing dog is that there are far fewer people here than the peeing boy. Did you know that the peeing boy of Brussels theoretically has a sister? That's right, there's a girl statue too, happily taking pee on the streets of Brussels. The boy gets all the, uh, all the press, but the girl's a pretty funny statue too. <laughs> Make sure you check out the main square because you never know what you're going to find here. There's some kind of goofy game going on here. We thought it was soccer initially. We don't know what it is. Everyone has a bit. There's some little ball they're chasing around. And the yellow team's kicking butt. The quirky food stop that we recommend for your DIY quirky tour of Brussels is Mary's Chocolate. Now Mary's Chocolate is the first female chocolatier in Brussels and also the provider of chocolates to the royal family. If it's good enough for them, we have to give it a try. Mary's Chocolate also makes some special chocolate. Pink chocolate, it's really a chocolate. It's not white chocolate, it's not dark chocolate, it's not milk chocolate, it is pink chocolate, a completely different variety of cocoa bean. And I'm super curious to see what this tastes like. Say that the pink chocolate tastes just slightly of berries and a cross between white chocolate and milk chocolate. It's a very distinctive flavor that is different from other chocolates that I've tried. It's really kind of fun to try something so unique. For our next stop on Quirky Brussels Tour, we are somewhere that has really unique characteristics and is probably something you didn't expect to see in a quirky Brussels video, but that helps make it quirky. <laughs> we are at a site outside of central Brussels and it is not the gorgeous church you see behind me. It's a cemetery. There are some really unique things at the cemetery and we can't wait to see them. These things on the ground are a hint to where we're going next, and it's one of the most unique features about this particular cemetery. One of the reasons why we're here. Can you guess what it is? Oh wow, it's really big. Wow. That's right, we are at an underground crypt. It's a little bit echoey down here. It's huge. This underground crypt is the only one like it in Europe and it takes up around one hectare of underground space. It's massive. Wow. It's very long, maybe two or three city blocks. We'll put the rough dimensions here in addition to what she said about it being one hectare, but it is really enormous. Since it's the only one like it in Europe, it's easy for us to say we've never seen anything like this. <laughs> bit of a smell since this was underground and no fresh air got in here. So they changed to burying people in metal caskets, which honestly caused more problems because the metal caskets were completely airproof. And as a body decomposes, it lets off gases until, boom, yeah, the bodies would explode, the caskets would explode, sometimes it would destroy the exteriors of the crypts and they have to be rebuilt. So honestly, it caused a bigger mess. So what do you do? You have a smell or you have a mess? Well, I think they fixed it by putting air holes into the caskets, no more exploding bodies. But unfortunately, by the time they figured that out, the crypts were starting to fall into disarray. For around 30 years, these crypts were, were just here below ground. They were a mess of cobwebs and plants and who knows what else was down here until the city started cleaning this up 
very recently, about 12 years ago or so, and they completely renovated it so that we're able to see it and walk through it and pay our respect to the people who went before us. I'm glad there's no more exploding bodies. It's really neat down here. Remember the gallery that we were at earlier today? Well, the fellow that that's named after is buried right here. His statue used to have a head, maybe it's being restored. amazing features of this place is that there's an original bronze cast statue of the thinker by Rodin. We didn't expect to see this at all. In fact, we thought the only original one was in Paris. Some of the statues on these graves are so evocative, so emotional. Makes you kind of sad. Which is not really the feeling we were going for, but yeah, that's what it is. Died at age 24, a soldier. If you decide to visit the cemetery, it's well worth the ride out here. It's not very far from central Brussels, 15 or 20 minutes by Metro, and it's free to come into. There are free bathrooms just inside the gate, and they're public free bathrooms, which might be a first for us on this trip. Last tip, make sure that you check out the hours for the beautiful church behind me because it is closed while we are here and it looks amazing. And it is the site of the Royal Crypt. They have some posh surroundings that we are not able to have access to. Next time. Welcome back to another day in Belgium. Today we have hopefully escaped the busy central historic district of Brussels and instead we're on the outskirts. This is mini Europe and it's right next to the Atomium and we're going to spend today exploring both of them and seeing what they have to offer. Are they worth a day trip? Let's go find out. This sort of feels like a this is your life <laughs> theme park for us because many of these miniatures actually look familiar to us. These are places that we've been. And it's kind of a trip to see all of them. Uh, starting with some of our Scandinavian countries, which are some of our favorites. We have uh, Denmark behind me and we have Sweden right in front of me. This is really kind of neat. It's fun to go down memory lane. And this is Finland, which is a country that we actually have not been to, but I kind of feel like we have because Minnesota was founded by a significant number of immigrants from Finland. Minnesota has a ton of saunas, especially in Northern Minnesota where a lot of the Finns settled. Uh, apparently in Finland, there are more saunas owned by people than cars. So we might have to visit. The detail on these is absolutely amazing. They've even recreated the flower carpet that takes place in Grand Plants every other year. The detail here is pretty amazing. We wanted to go to Dinant on this trip, but we're not gonna make it, unfortunately. Next time. These replicas are all built to a 1 25th scale. Bill for scale. Look how big the Eiffel Tower still is. I have to admit, it's easier to see the detail in this Arc de Triomphe than the actual Arc de Triomphe because it's so big. What do you think of the Atomium so far? We're not at the Atomium yet. Yeah, I know, but you can see it. Uh, it's shiny. Doesn't look very big. We 
love Porto. So this one might be our favorite. <laughs> Look at that. It's, they've got the detail down to the satellite dishes on the fronts of the houses. Isn't that amazing? And this here is the Gimarnsch Castle. Uh, if you haven't seen that video, check it out. It's so cool to see this castle that we were just at like seven months ago. When we were there, the drawbridge was closed. We were not able to cross it over to the main tower in the castle. <laughs> Venice, I know we were just there last year, but now I kind of want to go back. We love Venice so, so much. You know we had to do the cheesy pose. <laughs> This is El Escorial from Spain, which I think I went to back in college, but it might be time for a return visit. It's so impressive. I think I would appreciate it in a different way than I did back then. I mean, look how big it is. Wow. This is the bullring from Sevilla, and there are 6,000 individually hand-painted figurines attending a bullfight. We saw this thing on fire while we were eating lunch and we were a little bit alarmed. <laughs> I think they're gonna need more than those little uh, pea shooters. Oh my God, they're even putting it out from the boats. <laughs> Okay, we did not expect to see this here today. There's an actual piece of the Berlin Wall right here in mini Europe. <laughs> we have not been to Berlin, so this is the closest we've been. <laughs> That's really cool. I'm really excited about the next one. We've been looking at Berg Elt sort of from the whole park as we've been walking, and uh, we were here a long time ago, and it's a beautiful castle, and it's really neat to see it here. I think it might be time to go back to Germany too. Poland. been to session e baths uh, in Budapest and I had no idea that they were this big while we were there. It is so cool to see the reproductions of all these famous buildings all around Europe right here in one place. Upon further examination I'm kind of disappointed that there is no men playing chess in the pool like there was at the actual baths. <laughs> <laughs> we only spent one night in Zagreb before we went on to other places in Croatia, but we've always been meaning to go back. This could be an expensive park to visit. All we want to do is travel more now. The bridges of Ljubljana, we know these. Josip Plisnik designed them. We have a whole video about Ljubljana. <laughs> if you want to check that out, click the link above. Excuse me! Austria is absolutely beautiful in Europe. The mountains... Ah! So beautiful. Tower is frightfully close to Big Ben of London. <laughs> the same. And it looks like Greece is our final stop. We enjoyed Greece, but I have to say we enjoyed the Peloponnese way more than we enjoyed Athens. <laughs> it's a very well-fitting helmet, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs>
I barely fit in all of these. <laughs> Thank you for that trip down memory lane. That was a little bit unexpected. We didn't think we'd be like revisiting every European place that we've been to over the years, uh, but it was kind of fun. That was a lot of fun. Level of detail, I just can't say enough. How much detail they put into these models, it's just amazing. I'm Countless hours. I love that they included the political demonstrations and that they would show both sides. Like for Brexit, they showed people who wanted to stay as part of the EU and people who wanted to Brexit. Yeah. It was really cool. Well, now we are pivoting and... <laughs> We're headed up there. We're headed up to this thing. What is it? I don't know. We're going to go find out. <laughs> So here's what we know about the Atonium so far. It is shaped like an atom and it was built for the World Fair, sort of like how the Eiffel Tower was built for the World Fair in Paris. Brussels got a giant atom. I'm so curious to see the inside of this. You know, it's really impressive to go up the Eiffel Tower. Maybe this one will be equally impressive. bigger closer up. Yes, I have an atom growing out of my head. <laughs> it's really cool so far, although I see stairs. Boy, this better not be a bunch of stairs. Looks like there's a line. was built for the 1958 World's Fair to acknowledge great scientific advances happening at the time. It was supposed to only be a temporary exhibit, but it was so popular they could not carry out its planned demise. The structure was not maintained and eventually deteriorated enough that major renovations were required. Instead of tearing it down, it was decided to undertake extensive and expensive work to restore and improve it. This work took nearly two years and cost 26 million euro. The Atomium was proudly reopened on February 2006 and is now the most visited attraction in Brussels. I think I was a little bit underwhelmed by the Atomium and I was impressed by Mini Europe. What did you think? Yeah, about the same. Atomium was really, really crowded. There was just a ton of people here, and it's, it's the thing to do. It's like the Eiffel Tower of Brussels. And yeah. So everybody comes here. Welcome back to another day in Belgium. We are still in Brussels, and it's going to be a hot one today. It's going to be over 100 degrees. <laughs> so we thought we should probably find somewhere that's hopefully air conditioned. So what you have behind me is Train World. Train World looks like an amazing train museum. They have a special exhibit on royal trains. We're gonna go find out whether it's worth your time if you're here in Brussels. Let's go check it out. One of the reasons we wanted to come see this rail museum was that train travel really makes Europe work as a tourist. And especially this part, you can go pretty much anywhere in France, the Netherlands, or Belgium, and you don't need a car. It's amazing. The train museum here is actually built into an old railway station. 
It's been decommissioned, but you can see behind me the new station, and there's just constantly trains going by doing what trains do. Let's go explore the museum and understand more about the history and more about how the train systems work here in Belgium. The museum is divided into three main areas, steam, diesel electric, and the Royal Train Exhibit. As you make your way through the museum, there's an audio guide you can use on your phone to tell you more, and I mean a lot more, about all the things that you see. The entire museum is incredibly interactive, and you can step inside many of the locomotives and train cars. Honestly, doing this is the only way to really appreciate the engineering and the sheer size of the engines. In the steam room, you can learn how rail construction works. And even try your hand at being a train engineer. I don't know what he thought he was doing either. You can make the train horn blow, but we didn't see any of their cool hats around to try on. The first hall was really dark, so we weren't able to say anything, but in it we learned that Brussels was the first capital in the entire world to be connected by train. I had no idea that Brussels had that rich of a train history, which is really neat. And actually, Belgium had the first national train system in all of Europe, maybe in all of the world. And dignitaries from other countries used to come here to understand how it worked. And pretty much it spread from there. Really neat to learn a lot more about the history of Belgium and trains. Also, did you know that before the train system came along, there was no need for synchronized clocks. So starting with the steam engine era, it drove all these requirements and systems to synchronize clocks so that you knew what time your train was gonna come. Neat. One of the museum's showpieces is this green engine, the Type 12 Atlantic, built right here in Belgium and designed to quickly carry passengers between Brussels and the port city of Ostend. Only six of them were ever produced. In 1939, it set the world record for speed of a commercial service steam engine when it went from Brussels to Ostend in just 57 minutes. Unfortunately, the record was only held for a few months before it was broken by an American train company. That's Bill for Stout. In the 1930s, when steam engines gave way to diesel and electric, you ended up with trains that were one single car long. This is a diesel train, and the entire train is just this one car. That's it. Past the port, no, no return, baby, on the summer night. Shy love and a spark of love to be. Starts the light and the month time night burn like the ground I leave. I will leave it on the next train, baby. I do believe. Come on, let's ride this train. train cars date back to the early 1900s and they're sort of like the Air Force One of trains. The interior is super luxurious and would have been a great way for the kings of Belgium to travel. I didn't 
attention. Is a pedal like a car? Sorry, neutral. What could go wrong? How fast do you think I should be going? Not only can you be an engineer, they also have train simulators and you can see if you can avoid crashing the train. We were grateful they were slow when we were there, so we could give it a try. <laughs> By the time you're done exploring the exhibits, you're probably pretty tired. On your way out, you can try a variety of first class seats from all the major rail companies. See which one you like best. The engine you see behind me is a replica from 1835, and this is a fitting end to the museum. We've really enjoyed our time here, learning a lot about Belgium and their fantastic train history. And if you are having not the best weather, you want to break from some of the sightseeing, want to go to a museum, this is a great way to spend a few hours if you're in Brussels. All kinds of things to see, whether you're into new trains, old trains. We've also been to the Utrecht Museum in the Netherlands, and although this one wasn't as big, I would say some of the history stuff is actually a lot better, and it's something we'd recommend.